don't know any other religion or faith that celebrates the death of their saviour or celebrates the death of their leader. I've never known anybody else to celebrate it, but we do as Christians because we understand what the outcome is with the resurrection. Today is a day where I want to reiterate to you to understand what Christ did on the cross and what Christ did in the grave. I think back to John the Baptist when he baptised Jesus in the water, which is a, a symbol of dying to the old and coming in the new. The Bible says that John took Jesus down in the water and during this time when Jesus goes down into the water, we hear no words and we hear no voice. But when Jesus came up out of the water, it's like coming up out of the grave. When Jesus came up out of the water, there was a voice according to Matthew 3.17 that was heard saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And here for the first time since Genesis, we see the fullness of the Godhead. Even as Jesus rose from the dead with all power in his hand and all exousia, and exousia in Greek means authority, we see that there is a fullness of his power, a completion. He rose, both Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He rose from the dead. I love the words that Jesus said preempting his death in the book of John chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus says, no man will take my life, but I will lay it down. The Romans didn't take his life. The Jewish religious order didn't take his life. The crowd didn't take his life. Injustice didn't take his life. He laid his life down. The Bible says he had at his command thousands of angels, but he called upon them not because he laid down his life. In the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says of Jesus that we as Christians are raised with the same spirit that quickened Jesus' body. Paul said this, we have that same spirit, that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in us. It goes on in Romans 8, 11 that Paul says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, we have to understand that it is God the Father. We have to understand that it is the Holy Spirit. We gotta understand that it is Jesus Christ. It is the Godhead. In Genesis 1, 26, we see the beginning of the Godhead where the Word of God said, let us make man in our image, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And here we see according to Paul and here we see in the baptism of Christ as a preempt towards the preempt before the resurrection that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all intertwined. And Paul is saying that that very same spirit, that very same anointing, that very same Godhead is at work in our lives when we understand the resurrection power of Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that we may know Him. And that's my call today, that we might know Him. The word Christian doesn't seem to have as much power, influence as it once did. Anybody and everybody can say they're Christian. You could be cussing and using four letter words. You could be narcissistic. narcissistic. You can be misogynist. Uh, you, you, can, you can be running for power or doing anything else and you can claim to be a Christian. That's how cheap the word is. But to be a Christian means that you have died to yourself. To be a Christian means you've been risen in Him. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.24, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but rather Christ who lives in me. When Christ went to that cross, he went for you and me. When Christ went to that cross, he went as you and I. He took what we deserve. He became the sacrifice of atonement that completed everything. When he went into that grave, he went as you and me. When he got up out of that grave, he got up as you and me. And Paul makes that connection in Ephesians 2, 1. He says, and you were dead in your offence and sins. In verse five, he says, but we have been made alive who were once dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus is a shadow of who we are meant to be. In Ephesians 2, verse four, Paul says that we have been made alive together with Christ. 
That is by grace that we have been saved. We've got to be able to understand the power of grace that is unearned. You can't earn it. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. It's God's grace. And if Christ didn't conquer death, then we could not conquer death. When He got up, we got up. When He died, we are meant to die. Die to our old ways. Die to our flesh. Die to our own way of thinking. When we understand the fullness of the power of the cross and resurrection, then we can say to sin, and we can say to condemnation that the bill has been paid, that Jesus has paid our debt, that Jesus took our death and He rose up. And the Apostle Paul says we have been made alive. We are meant to be alive in Him. We're not meant to just survive. We are called to thrive. For too long, the church just survives. For too long, Christians are just surviving. But we are not called to survive. We're called to thrive. So the question is, have we really experienced the resurrection power or are we still stuck in the grave? Now, I'm not denying anyone's salvation. I'm not denying anyone hasn't been saved. That's the power of the cross. But the problem is five years, 10 years, 15 years, we're still going back to the cross. We're still at the cross dealing with sin. We're still at the cross dealing with our imperfections. We're still at the cross dealing with our condemnation. There's gotta be the time when we as a church begin to live in the resurrection power and we move on in the victory that He gave us. The problem is too many of us are still in the grave and we're allowing ourselves, we're giving ourselves permission for the stone to be rolled on that grave. When Jesus rose again, that was to evict us from the grave. We're stuck in a grave and God is calling us out of the grave. We're stuck in a mindset because we find it more familiar even though we know it hurts us. That's what religion does. When Jesus came, He wanted to change their mindset. He said, the Old Testament is only a shadow of the things to come, but I'm bringing it to light. The problem was, was that the religion of the day knew that it had problems, but they were comfortable with that mindset and weren't prepared to change. And God wants to change our mindset. He wants us to be made alive. Paul says in Ephesians 2.2 that we walked according to the God of this world. And the God of this world is holding us in chains. The God of this world is holding us in sin. The God of this world is holding us in condemnation. Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 3 that we are by nature sinners. We're in the grave, Paul says. We are children of wrath. It doesn't say one of us or two of us, but we're all born with that mindset. We're all born in that flesh. We're all born in that condemnation. But when Jesus died and rose again, He died and rose again so that the stone that holds you in that grave would be rolled away. I think of the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. And I think about how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised him out of the position of being dead. And we as Christians have got to be raised out of the position of being dead. God hasn't called you just to be saved and die and be with Him. God's called you to be saved and resurrected so you can live in Him. When He called Lazarus out of the grave, He basically was saying to Lazarus, I'm getting ready to change your position, now come forward. And when we get saved, so God's Spirit can say to us, I'm gonna change your position, come forward. We've got to let death be death and resurrection be resurrection. And the Bible says that as Lazarus came forward, he was still bound in his grave clothes. And he said to his disciples, you can read yourself, loosen him and they unwrapped him. Here's the problem, I'm not doubting your salvation. I'm not doubting that you've had a taste of the resurrection. But we're coming out of the grave, still in our grave clothes. We haven't been unwrapped. 
We've still got wrapped around us the spirit of condemnation. we still got wrapped around us the spirit of inferiority. we still got wrapped around us the temptation and desires of sin. we still got wrapped around us the conditions of the God of this age blinding our eyes. It's not enough to raise, be raised from the dead, but we've got to have the grave clothes taken off of us. And Lazarus couldn't do it by himself. Jesus raised him from the dead. That was the hardest place. But then Jesus says, it's not enough that your position has been changed. But now I've got to change your mindset. I need to have those grave clothes taken off of you. And he said to his disciples, unwrap him. How are we unwrapped from our our grave clothes? It's the word of God that's alive in the Holy Spirit. I don't need to go back and be delivered Five years later. I don't need to go back and be delivered 10 years later. I meet Christians who've been saved five years, 10 years, 15 years, and they're getting delivered. And I say to them, did you go back to the world? Now, if they went back to the world, I understand why they need to be delivered. If they went back to the things of the past, I understand because the Bible says it's like a dog going back to its vomit. It's seven times worse. I understand then you need deliverance. But if you've been saved and you've been set free, Why are you going for deliverance? Doesn't the blood of Jesus work? Isn't the blood of Jesus strong enough? Isn't the cross and the resurrection more powerful? Friends, when I got born again and set free, I took off the grave clothes. I took off the bindings of the grave clothes. I took off the past hurt. I took off the past inferiorities. I took off the past insecurities. How did you do that? I did it through the Word of God. Romans 8 verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I began to realize that the Word of God is alive. I began to realize that the Word of God, when applied like a sword, according to Hebrews 4.12, that separates soul and flesh and spirit. And that I could differentiate between what is of God and what wasn't of God through the power of the cross. Jesus changed the position of Lazarus, but the disciples, by loosing him, would change his condition. Now, I've got to tell you something. My condition, I pray, is always changing. But my position has already been changed by the blood. At the cross, my position was changed. But my condition is always changing. I'm always desiring to be more like Jesus. Jesus. I had a laugh with Josiah uh, uh, some time back and we're just talking as as you talk. We talk as a father and son. We talk as co-leaders in the church and and, uh, it was just, it was, I find it rather, rather quite novel and Josiah said to me, well, you know, Dad, you know, your reputation was you were pretty tough. <laughs> and I said, yes, son, but you now have that position. I don't. Now you're the tough guy. I'm the nice guy. Some of you aren't laughing, okay? But the fact of the matter is, it's because of the job and the position. It wasn't because of my nature, who I am. But I'm talking about the process of unwrapping. I'm talking about the process of change. And I'm talking about, it's not enough for my position to be changed. And that's what Jesus' authority does. But my my condition has also got to change. And that's by me unwrapping these grave clothes on my life. Jesus raised Lazarus, but the disciples loosed Lazarus. It's not just you've been raised from your dead, but you need to be loosed in his anointing. You have to be loosed in his resurrection power. Could you imagine what happens when we as Christians understand and walk in the authority that's found in the resurrection power? I'm gonna tell you something. It will change our whole outlook. It'll change in the way that we move, in the way we talk, in the way we react. When Christ rose from the dead, He didn't rise to continue his old life where death was still a threat. But he rose into a new dimension, a next dimension to die no more. Jesus rose to a new dimension. They no longer recognized his physical body. The physical body that Jesus died in was not the physical body that he came back in. It wasn't the same body. How do I know? Because the Bible says they didn't recognize him. When Mary was at the tomb, she thought he was a gardener. 
He didn't realise it. When they walked uh, on, on the Emmaus walk, they didn't realise they were walking with Jesus until later on. So here's the situation. We have got to understand that next dimension. We've got to understand what God has for us. We've got to stop living in the grave dimension. We have to start living in the resurrection dimension. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6. Verse 4 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love which, with which He loved us. There was a great love with which He loved us. Verse 5, That even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, He made us alive. This is what I love about the resurrection power, Paul says. He says, even when we're in our grave, He has the power to make us alive. You might feel dead in your Christian walk. You might feel dormant in your spiritual journey. You might feel like you've hit a wall. You know the Lord, but you're in that grave. You're in that rut. Well, I wanna tell you that a clue, a, a, from the, the Word of God, Ephesians 2, 4, verse 5, Jesus says, I will make you alive even though you are dead. It goes on to say that, that together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and by that grace you have been raised up. And it says, and that we will be seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What is Christ raising you up for? to be seated in heavenly places. Now, when Paul says here about seated in heavenly places, he's not talking about after you die physically. He's talking about now. We are meant to be in a heavenly mindset now. We're meant to be in another dimension now. We're meant to have a different way of thinking now. That's what Scriptures of faith is all about. It's not looking what is seen. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, he says, do not look upon that which is seen, but rather that which is unseen. For that which is seen is temporary, but that which is unseen is eternal. We have got to have our eyes on the eternal thing rather than us having our eyes on the temporary things of this world. We've got to start thinking heavenly places. We've got to start walking in faith in heavenly places. Where does it begin? I tell you my favourite place to be in when I have heavenly thoughts. It's when I do the routine mundane things. You know, the routine mundane things, you know, they're so mundane you don't have a thing. Is there something you do each day? Is there something you do which is mundane and routine? Easy enough for you to think lightly of. The most mundane routine thing I do is wash dishes. We have a dishwasher in our house. It's called Sean Hansen. <laughs> My wife is a cook who believes she shouldn't wash dishes. That's okay. I don't mind washing the dishes. I really don't. I love my wife and I love to honour her. I don't mind doing it. Nice pink jacket, Sandra. I like it, okay? <laughs> she came out in all black this morning. I said, you can't do that on Resurrection Sunday. There's gotta be colour. There's gotta be colour. He's alive. If I was in the black American church, every woman would be wearing a bright, colourful hat. Not only people wear hats in church are guys, okay? But the fact of the matter is, that's how it would be. So when I do those mundane routine things like wash the dishes, guess what? I don't have to think. But you know what I can do then? I begin to think of heavenly places. I begin to think of godly things. I begin to think of whatever. And I begin to think and I begin to meditate. I begin to dwell. And then in the middle of washing dishes, all of a sudden, I'm just moving in a different dimension. And I'm staying too long in the dishes. I got soaked crusted hands from being in the this water. I've rubbed the bowls too long with that tea towel because my mind is not there. My mind is not in the mundane. My mind is not a routine. It's in the heavenly places. I remember when I was a young fella, I was a glazer, not a grazer, but a glazer working with glass. Now this can be dangerous and I paid the price sometimes, but it'll be mundane so I wouldn't think. But you gotta be careful because you get a cut and you get a few stitches as I did. But I'd be out there in the mundane, but in those couple of years when I was in that area as a glazer, not a grazer, as a glazer, I would let my imagination go into heavenly places. I'd begin to think and daydream about doing things for God. I began to think and daydream about lifting up the name of the Lord. I began to dream and think about the things that would give God glory. I did it for two years. 
Until the day came when this six foot something skinny, scrawny preacher called Rod Kimmelak says, do you wanna come into the ministry? I didn't have to have a second to think about it because I daydreamed about it for two years. What was the key? I put myself in heavenly places. I didn't think of, well, I come from Woodridge. I didn't think of, well, I, I, I finished only grade 10. I didn't think of, well, uh, 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 only my mum's saved, nobody else. I didn't think of, oh, uh, well, I don't have friends in high places. I didn't think of, I'm not a preacher's kid. I didn't think of this area. All I did was think of heavenly places. When I think of heavenly places, it tells me that I am called by Him, that I have a purpose in Him, I have a destiny in Him, and that my gifts would bring me before rulers, that God would open up doors. I need not fear man or think that man would open the door, but rather I would dwell in the heavenly places in Him. What is in your mind? Your sickness, your divorce, your singleness, your uncertainty about tomorrow. Let me tell you, friend, when you're dwelling on your negativity as you are, when you're dwelling on your disposition as you are, when you're dwelling upon the injustices, when you're dwelling upon the hurt, there is no joy of the Lord in you. Therefore, there is no strength in you. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We have lost our strength because we've lost the joy of the Lord. We've lost the power of giving thanks to God. What are you thanking God for? We go, I've got nothing to thank God for. I've gone through a rough time. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. You thank Him if for nothing else, your salvation. You thank Him that He died for you on the cross. You thank Him that He rose again. He calls your name. You thank Him that as the Apostle Paul says, that you have been made alive in Christ Jesus. That that very same Spirit that was with Jesus and God when they said, let us make man in our image in Genesis 1.26 is the very same Spirit the Apostle Paul says that quickens you from a life of death in your trespasses and sins. And if that's not something to give, Give thanks to God for you need to be born again. Take off those grave clothes. Let somebody grab an end of it and spin you. There's too many mummies walking around in the church. We need to unwrap you. It's like my Christmas message. The gift is covered up by a wrapping and sometimes you only see the wrapping. You don't realise the gift. And right now your wrapping might not look good. Right now your wrapping might seem hideous. Maybe instead of using Easter paper, they use Christmas paper. Maybe instead of using birthday paper, they use retirement paper. I don't know. But just tear the paper off for Pete's sake, whoever Pete is. Tear the paper off and see the gift that's in there because many times the gift that God has for you is wrapped up in things that we don't want. So take off the deaf clothes. Take off the deaf bindings and allow the resurrection power of Jesus to come out. If we have a risen Lord, then we need to be a risen church. And we can't be a risen church if we're living in the grave. We have got to be a different people. Time is gone. Can the musicians come up, please? I want us to understand the grace of God. I want us to understand the power of the resurrected Christ. I was thinking of the letter of John, not the gospel, the letter of John. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 is the letter of John. And John is saying this and it just played on my mind a bit in this time of this message preparation. It says this, He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I think of that word, propitiation. The very word propitiation means that something that protects us, it's something that shielded us. This is what the blood of Jesus is. The blood of Jesus is our propitiation for our sins. It's the covering. It's what separates us from the curse of this world. Now as reading and listening to this particular area about the old space shuttles, 
And uh, on the space shuttle, I don't know if you ever think of it, if you're, you're old enough to know it, but on the nose is a cone. It's a black cone, a black cone on the nose of a space shuttle. And if you let her on Google a space shuttle, you see this big black cone on the nose. And it's not there to keep your eyes from being blinded, but in actual fact, in the aerodynamics, it's a propitiator, which is meant to protect the astronauts from the atmosphere. Because when that spacecraft would go into space, but especially when it come back into the Earth's orbit, the atmosphere is so violent and heated, it needs a propitiator, it needs protection as it enters into the atmosphere to save them from burning up. And as that space shuttle shudders, and as it comes back in the atmosphere and communication seem to fail, that propitiator on the front of the nose of the craft keeps the astronauts safe. God wants us to leave this world and go to heavenly places. Hello. Hello. Anybody there? He wants us to leave this way of thinking and go into heavenly thinking. And what happens many times is we don't put the propitiator on correctly. See, to leave this way of thinking, to go into heaven's way of thinking requires of us to leave an atmosphere, it, it, right, right? There are atmospheres that are negative, yeah? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We have to leave one atmosphere to go to the other area. And the reason why we can't go into the other atmosphere is because we don't have the propitiator on there protecting us from all that things that want to consume us. And so while we're trying to get into a different atmosphere because we hear negativity or, or we hear defeat or we hear sickness or we hear whatever we hear and we feel the shake and we feel the turbulence because we're wanting to break into this other atmosphere, if you don't have that property at it in place, we get consumed or burnt up by it. And all of a sudden, anger consumes us. All of a sudden, um, fear consumes us. All of a sudden, hurts or unforgiven hurts or disappointments consume us and we're unable to get to that next atmosphere. See, this is the power of the blood. If you don't apply the blood of Jesus correctly over you as a propitiator, you can't enter into that next dimension. How do you know when you've reached it? Well, we all have things that irritate us. Yes? Stop looking at me, Shane, okay? But we all have things that irritate us. And it gets our goat, it gets us angry. Maybe you experienced that today. Maybe you experienced it yesterday. But when that thing comes that irritates you and you begin to react or get angry, what it means is that the devil is using your old address. He sent a letter to Grave Street, Tombstone Alley. You know, the place where you were buried. And he sends it to that old address because he believes that's where you still live. And when you respond to the mail, you're saying, I still live here. But we've got to respond differently. We've got to respond in a way that's not natural. And when we respond in a way that's natural, we're saying, you got the wrong address. I'm not on Tombstone Alley, but rather I'm on heavenly places. I changed address in my mind. I changed address in my thinking. I changed address in my behaviour. What I used to do, I don't do because I no longer live on Tombstone Alley. I now live in heavenly places. And devil, you can't get the mail to me here. So when the mail can't get me there, you know what I do? It's return to sender. Return to sender, devil, because I don't live there no more. I have a propitiator that has protected me from the atmosphere that wants to consume me. Now, a lot of you here have gone through things that probably should have killed you. And probably some of you are going through things that still wants to kill you. It wants to kill you physically. It wants to kill you spiritually. It wants to kill your marriage. It wants to kill your children or, or whatever else. It wants to kill you. And 
And we want our spouse to protect us. And we want our past to protect us. We want our church to protect us. And we want our government to protect us. We want our experience to protect us. We want our training to protect us. But the only propitiator that really works is the blood of Jesus. It doesn't mean that we can't be encouraged by all these loved ones. That's not the focus. Our focus is Jesus. That is the propitiator that's supposed to be on the nose of our vessel that penetrates from one atmosphere to the next. And as we penetrate through, it's really violent. But once we've broken into it, it's like you're floating on air. I want you to be liberated. Can the communion guys come forward to communion? It's a bit slow on that there. I want us to take communion this morning in this resurrection service. We did it on Good Friday. And we took that remembrance of Christ on the Passover where we ate that bread and we drank that cup. And now we're gonna do it in the resurrection. Can I ask you, we are Pentecostal charismatics and there's some beautiful things about that. We're not religious. But at the same time, we forget to be holy. Let me tell you about this communion. This is not a cup for you to take for your children. Now, if you're walking your children through it, that's okay. But if your child is saying, I want one, then you say, no, buddy, you're not getting one. You give them a biscuit or a cookie or something. This is meant to have significance. And if you don't teach them to have significance now, they won't have significance later. I was fortunate I learned the significance of it. Now, I was a Methodist before I got born again. I was probably 12 or 13 years of age. And before I could partake of communion, I had to go for what they call confirmation, which is six weeks of one hour class before I could take it. But here's the irony of religion, right? I wasn't even born again. I was taught how to take it, but I wasn't born again. But I understood the significance. The Bible says in Corinthians from Paul that Christians should not partake of this if they've got anger or offence or sin in their life. The Apostle Paul says in the New Testament that when you partake of this and you have sin in your own life, then you bring sickness upon your body. That's what the Bible says in the New Testament. You say, well, should I abstain? Only if you can't repent. If you can't say, Jesus, forgive me of my anger, forgive me of my sin, forgive me, then you abstain. But if you can ask Jesus to forgive you in that moment, it's okay. You don't need six one hour classes. You just say, I repent. Let me tell you who else this is not for. This is not for the unsaved. If you don't know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, then this is not for you. This is the believer's table. If you're not born again, you don't take this. But what if I want to do it? Then let me help you right now. Bow your head. Say this prayer. Say Jesus. Say this prayer. Say Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart, my life, Right now, I repent of all my wrong. I declare you are my Saviour and my Lord. In Jesus' Name, Amen. There you go. Now you qualify. (laughs) Now you qualify. Let's stand. Everything is workable. Everything is doable. If you want to walk your kids through it, you go ahead and do that. But if it's just a snack time, I ask you, don't let them do it. Don't let them put down something that has a standard in our house. Well, my kids will play up. I prefer them to play up than take disrespect towards what belongs to the Lord. Sometimes, friends, we need a little bit more holiness, a little bit more Jesus. We take the cup of the bread and Lord, we give you thanks for this bread. I thank You, Almighty God, that it represents the body of Jesus Christ. And with this cup, Almighty God, I identify with You and Your death and resurrection. And I eat this remembrance of You. Let's eat together. In the same like manner, He took the cup, which represents the blood. I thank You, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Come on, church. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Who says so? We say so, right? Who says so? We say so. And with this cup, Lord, I acknowledge the work of the cross. 
and the resurrection power, the strength again. I thank you, Jesus, for the blood. I thank you, Jesus, for the body. I thank you, Lord, that we are redeemed. I thank you, Lord, that on this Resurrection Sunday I can be with friends. I thank you on this Res Resurrection Sunday. They're not just friends, Lord. They're family. We are blood relatives. And the blood that runs through our veins is the blood of Jesus. How? Because we're seated in heavenly places. Let us lift up our heads. Let us lift up our eyes above the circumstances we are facing. And let us see Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I say it in your mighty name.